It's Father's Day. That's the best announcement we can make today, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful, Father's Day? Um, I feel like I'm on the inside of an awesome joke now. Like I'm finally get to celebrate Dad, Father's Day as a father, and I think that's just the knees of the bee. That's pretty cool. Um, and so because of that, I'm going to try to sprinkle in all the most awful, corniest Father's Day jokes I can in the next hour and a half. I know that's no different than any other Sunday, but uh, in any case. Uh, so we have uh, Lee, Lee and Rose did a raffle, or are going to do a raffle, um, a raffling. I, I don't know. They just told me to take a ticket, so let's see what they come up with. First off, we'd like to recognize all of our men this morning and all the contributions that they give to our church. Do all of you have a ticket? Everybody got a ticket? Okay. Um, We have an amazing group of men here at the church, not just the fathers, but the men, because when we come to our men and we say, we need somebody to work in the nursery, we get them. When we need somebody to fix the parking lot, they fix it. When we need a 25-foot Christmas tree in the front yard, they put it there. Uh, Whatever we need, they're there to do it for us, and they are so supportive of our church and everything that we do, and we're just grateful for each and every one of you. So let's give you a hand this morning. And now I have a list of the top ten things you'll never hear a dad say. And this is just for entertainment. I probably should have given this to Morgan. He could have used it, but... Anyway, number 10. Well, how about that? I'm lost. Looks like we'll have to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> number 9. You know, Pumpkin, now that you're 13, you'll be ready for unchaperoned car dates. Won't that be fun? <laughs> number 8. I noticed that all your friends have a certain hostile attitude. I like that. <laughs> Um, Here's a credit card and the keys to my new car. Go crazy. What did you mean you want to play football? Figure skating's not good enough for you, son? Um, Your mother and I are going away for the weekend. You might want to consider throwing a party. Number four. Well, I don't know what's wrong with your car. Probably one of those doohickey thingies, you know, that makes it run or something. Just have it towed to a mechanic and pay whatever he charges. Number three, no son of mine is going to live under this roof without an earring. Now quit your belly aching and let's go to the mall. (laughs) Number two, what do you want to go and get a job for? I make plenty of money for you to spend. (laughs) And the number one thing you'll never hear a dad say, what do I want for Father's Day? Oh, don't worry about that. It's no big deal. And actually, they do say that a lot. So thank you guys for all you do. Thank you. We'll have our catechism question here, and then Lee will come up for our call to worship. Question 25 this morning. Does Christ's death mean all our sins can be forgiven? Yes, because Christ's death on the cross fully paid the penalty for our sin. God graciously imputes Christ's righteousness to us as if it were our own and will remember our sins no more. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Praise God that we're saved because he saves us. Lee? I'll be reading from John 8, verses 31 through 38. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answer him, We are offsprings of Abraham, and I have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offsprings of Abraham. 
yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father.
Do you know how sometimes things happen and you, you, you think about it and you're like, I'm not sure how this is going to work out? Anybody been there? I, I didn't know if Tammy was ever going to finish the drywall in my basement this week. But she showed up and got it done. Um, in, in any case, this is Father's Day. And as, as a guy who's in the pulpit, sometimes the wrestle is, do you preach because of all the holidays that I think that America celebrates, the easiest one to make a great biblical sermon out of is Father's Day, right? And that should be a little on the nose because we call God our Father in Heaven, right? You know, all the other ones I think could largely be twisted into a biblical sermon could be brought out of Independence Day or, or the one that's in the popular mind right now, Juneteenth. Right? It, there, there's lots of great ways to do that, but Father's Day is one that I think is the greatest and the easiest to do so. And yet I still didn't do that here because I thought it's part three in a, in a sermon series on missions. How can I make that about Father's Day? And I, I didn't really intend to or plan to. I thought I'll just stick to the plan because Lord knows when I deviate from the plan, it's usually not great. I'm, I'm not a good improviser. Uh, you know, I, I know it seems like I fly by the seat of my pants, but that's on purpose, right? Um, and so I walk up here and I look at my sermon outline, and I, this week is part three. It's, it's the how of missions. The how. Right? Because we've talked about the command. You know, we are, in fact, called to go, making disciples to replicate like ourselves. We talked about the who last week, not the band, but who do we make disciples of? See, I told you, Father's Day. Terrible, corny jokes. Right? Um, the Who is a rock band from Britain. I, I don't know if that's outside of your culture. Most of you aren't old enough to remember The Who, but just thought I would share. Um, so we've talked about the command and the who, but now we're talking about the how, right? And, you know, I, I prep this outline, and I'm looking at it, and I think, gosh, the Lord wrote a Father's Day sermon. And so here's what I mean by that. And, and, and really, this is how I'm introduced. This is our introduction here. So I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Let me read these verses together, and uh, then we'll, just, we'll jump right in, and, and you'll know what I mean. So if you're willing and able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as, I, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. Therefore do not be ashamed of this testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher." Which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. But the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Lord, I ask that this morning our time together would be faithful. Lord, help me to speak according to your will. And Lord, may your people be uh, uplifted by your words. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
All right, so a Father's Day sermon that's not about Father's Day, but is, but it wasn't on purpose or supposed to be. And so we're talking about the how. How do we practice missions, right? How do we practice discipleship? And and, and I think these three, there's three things that we see in this passage that are important. The first one is relationships, and it might actually be right. Boop. Boop. Yep, there it is. Yeah. (laughs) So relationships are an incredibly important part of how we make disciples, how we do missions. So let me just give some context about what we just read. This is a letter from Paul, who at this point is in prison. Right? He's being tried for apostasy and treason from the Roman authorities. And, and remember, we, we taught on that in Acts you know, several months ago. And he's writing to Timothy. And how does he describe Timothy here? You know, it's not as though a co-worker, hey, Timothy, you know, I, I know we had a really great time doing some labors there. He doesn't write to him as an indifferent individual or somebody he used to work with or somebody that he used to know. He says in verse 2, to Timothy, my beloved child. Now, fathers, does that not sound like a sentiment that you would share with your own offspring? And I know modern men were reserved and quiet and we, we don't share our feelings or talk about our issues. We bottle it up and we don't share and, until it's too late and it's too important, right? Let, let's not do that. It's not manly to not deal with your problems. The manly thing is to have our emotions and to know how to rightly interact with them. But that is how Paul interacts with Timothy, the recipient of this letter here. And he talks to Timothy as my beloved child. Now, Timothy was not the biological offspring of Paul. Right, because he talks about Timothy's other parents, his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. But relationships are inherently and intrinsically important. If you cannot have a relationship with a person whom you are trying to disciple, the person whom you are trying to share the hope of the gospel with, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I am going to say that statistically it's going to be really, really hard. The way we'd understand this or illustrate this, at least in the concept here, is that if you don't trust the person, why would you believe them? If the person you're trying to share the gospel with and to to make a disciple of, and they have serious trust issues with you, they don't like you, they think you're shady, right? They, They don't understand why you part your hair down that one side, right? If for whatever reason they look at you and think, I'm not sure, I really don't know, and I don't want to trust this person with the relationship, why would they trust you when you talk to them about the gospel? And so relationships are inherently important. I'm not saying that you need to be best buds with everybody you meet, right? Because uh, honestly, who's got the time, right? Jesus had 12 disciples, right? And the man was perfect. He knew exactly, and hear me, Jesus knew exactly how to manage his time well, right? How many of you wish you had that, right? Amen, yeah, yeah. Jesus knew how to perfectly manage his time and his finances, and and the guy was never like, I don't know where I'm going to get food. He he knew food was coming, and he knew that he had what he needed, and he trusted God in all those great and amazing, perfect ways. But Jesus had 12 disciples, right? So don't think you have to be absolute best pals with every person you meet. Human beings, we just don't have, and I believe this, and I say this as somebody who's painfully extroverted, right? And you've known me for a while. You know that I can be painfully extroverted. Um, Human beings don't have the mental or the emotional capacity to be best friends with everybody. We, We just don't. We're not made that way. God didn't intend for us to be that way. And that's part of why I think Facebook is so awful is because the culture and the concept of online social media is that you're best friends with everybody. How many of you have been somewhere and you ran into an old high school pal that you haven't seen for 10 or 20 or... Is anybody here old enough to be out of high school for 30 years? Let's just assume some of you might be. <laughs> you raised your hands. That's on you. Um, but let's say you ran into somebody you haven't seen since high school and, and you always have that awkward conversation. Of, oh, yeah, let's catch up sometime. That'll be great. We'll hang out. Even though in the back of your mind, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Right? Because you've already developed your friend group. And I'm not saying you shouldn't take advantage of opportunities like that to share the gospel, but... We've only got so much capacity for relationships. Because how many of you can amen to the reality that relationships are hard? 
Relationships are exhausting. Right? It's Father's Day, right? Oh, I'm sure every wife in the back of their mind right now is like, yep, relationships are exhausting sometimes. If he leaves his socks out on the floor one more time, I swear. No. But relationships are, and, and I say all this not to, to convince us that we shouldn't have better relationships or we shouldn't care about relationships or that we should go live under a rock in the woods. Right? That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that relationships are really important. And like anything else in life that matters, it takes effort. Right? And, and I know extroverted people kind of get a hall pass here because they just want to be friends with people but the reality is that even the most extroverted people probably are just keeping you at surface level. Right? They might always be up for everything, and they might always be fun and bubbly, and they might always be wanting to engage with strangers. And to be honest, I think that's kind of the appeal of it, is that not that they're building these great deep bonds of relationships in their lives, but by keeping everybody just kind of as good friends or acquaintances, you don't actually have to go real deep with anybody. And trust me, that's a lonely place. If you, if you have a thousand acquaintances that you can call up at any point and go hang out with, but you don't have those really tight-knit bonds that have deep, strong roots, you're going to be lonely when life gets hard. Right? So don't think that extroverts just get a pass on this because they can meet... They've never, my uncle never met a stranger. Like, and, and it's uncanny. It's weird. I've ran into people that go... McKinnis, are you Ray's grandson? Or are you Ray's boy? I mean, it depends on how. But the guy met everybody and was wanted to be friends with them. Even people like that, even people with that level of social skill or whatever you want to call it, if they don't have deep roots and those meaningful relationships, they're still going to be lonely when life gets hard. And on the flip side, introverts. I know introverts loved the pandemic, right? Any introverts? I won't look directly at you because I, I understand that that's uncomfortable for introverts. But, uh, the point is, I know a lot of introverts are like, I have to stay at home by myself and I'm not allowed to go out in public and I just get to read and do what I want by myself. I love it, right? And, and a lot of introverts I knew were like, I mean, Mary was just like, I have to stay home and not talk to people? Really? Mary loves people, but she, she is introverted in that manner. And I know that introverts, it's harder to be able to go out and build those initial steps. And yet, introverts can build some of the strongest, deepest roots and bonds in relationships. Because if an introvert's going to bother to be your friend, they're, they're, they're just in it. They've already made the mental decision, the mental capacity to build those roots. You're their friend for life, whether you know it or not. Right? And normally, the introverts there would amen, but... They're introverts, so they're going to be quiet and reserved in church service, but that's okay. Um, so relationships matter. They are deep. They're important. And it's about the depth of the roots of the relationship that matter. right? Not, and let's, let's be clear on something. I do not want to confuse longevity in friendship with depth of friendship. Right? You can be friends with somebody for 100 years and have a really shallow relationship. Right? We cannot confuse time of the relationship with depth of the relationship. And we know this because Paul and Timothy, they went through some stuff together. Yeah, They had been friends. They had built that bond over time. But the reason there was such a strong bond that Timothy would have tears over Paul's imprisonment, as it says in this passage, is because they had gone through hardships together. They had been through difficulties together. They had been through church planting together. They had done discipleship and administration and ministry and evangelism together. And they did this in a world that was hostile towards Christianity, that knew absolutely, utterly nothing about Jesus. And so they went and that relationship got deep and it got strong. In the same way that you might plant a sycamore tree by a raging stream, that sycamore tree is going to build a really deep, deep down strong root so that it can withstand a great deal of weather and a great deal of trial. Paul and Timothy, that's how it was. Their relationship was important because that was where they developed those deep roots. In fact, we might even say that relationships 
are the space in which discipleship happens. That might even be on the board behind my head. Yep. Yeah, see? Right there. Isn't that awesome? Relationships are the space in which discipleship happens. And the reason I say that is because if you want to share the gospel with people, remember, we aren't called to go make converts, are we? Everybody remembers that from two weeks ago. We're not called to make converts. We're called to make disciples. Yes, we're called to make disciples. And disciple is somebody who you spend time with, which means there must be a relationship there. And so ministry then or discipleship or missions takes place in the space we call a relationship. Right? And that relationship can have many different facets. It can be important. That's why I love the quote from Mark Dever that says that discipleship is doing what you're normally doing, taking somebody along the way, and talking about Jesus. That's, that's discipleship, and that's, that's what we're talking about here. Paul and Timothy, do you think they... Yes, they probably told corny jokes while they were walking down the street. They probably sat down and had hoagies, right? They probably ate street food because that was a common thing back in that day, I guess. I don't know. They did all kinds of normal things. Like we think of Paul spending all of his time like hunched over scrolls and studying. The reality is Paul probably lived his life in a similar manner to a lot of other people. He ate. He slept. He took walks. He enjoyed things. But the difference between Paul and many other people in his day and age was that Paul focused his life on Jesus. So even when he was in the midst of doing normal things, right? Anybody ever cook? How many of you for, is cooking a spiritual experience? I, I, okay. Food, Morgan loves food, it's spiritual, we get it. Um, but that, that's the difference there is that you, you spend time with people and you talk about Jesus and you focus on Jesus in the midst of doing regular things. So then relationships are important because they are the space in which this happens, that we make disciples, that we go deep with people, that we put down strong roots with people. And if you want to really be a model, if you want to model after Christ, because what does Paul say in verse 13? Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So Paul's saying to Timothy, he's re-exhorting him here. He's saying, you need to pattern yourself after me. So let's take a wild guess here. Who do you think Paul patterned his life after? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, right? How did Jesus structure his life or his ministry, at least in a manner that we see? He devoted humongous amounts of his time to discipling a small few Instead of going where he could fit thousands and thousands of people and share the gospel with them. Right? So next time you see a mega church preacher try to tell you something, remember that Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and on earth and could attract anybody he wanted, focused only on a few. Now I'm not saying, well, let's, let's just not even go down that rabbit hole. We imitate others as they imitate Jesus. Timothy imitated Paul as Paul imitated Christ. And if Christ is our object, he is our goal, he is the template. Christ was perfect and he had 12. So who are the people that you and your relationships are building deep, strong roots in the gospel with? Because you cannot find a verse in this passage that doesn't have the gospel richly through it. Relationships are the space in which discipleship happens. The second thing I want to talk about and this is a great segue, is doctrine. Doctrine is important. And I know, I I had a guy on Facebook who I know and I like and I care about. Uh, He shared something along the lines of, we don't need church, we need Jesus. We don't need religion, we need Jesus. And my question to him was, that's great, but how do you define who Jesus is? How How do you define our interaction with Christ? How do you define our worship? And he goes into this litany of things, and I think, that's religion. Religion is simply the, the structure in which we interact with God. In fact, religion is how we talk about and to God. How do we know what prayer is appropriate and, sec- and acceptable? How do we know we're not supposed to pray to Mary? Because religion tells us, because the Bible tells us so, because church history and tradition tells us that we have one intercessor, and his name is Christ. So doctrine is super important. It's incredibly important. 
And so many people in today's age are doctrinally weak. Many people in today's age do not know the deeper doctrines. And, and let me say this. You can only build as deep of roots and relationships and discipleship as you have deep roots of the gospel. Right? If your root, if your doctrine is not deep, your discipleship will also not be very deep. I'm not saying it's impossible to have deep relationships that matter in Jesus without a strong doctrine. But let me tell you, I mean, I, I'm not a gardener. I understand miracle Grow is a great kit for people that want to grow things that aren't good at growing things. It's me. I'm not good at growing things. Doctrine is like miracle Grow for plants, right? You don't have to be a great theologian. You don't have to be a great pastor or teacher of the Bible in the same way that you don't have to be a great green thumb to grow things. Just put it in miracle Grow. make sure it has water, right? Doctrine is important because it helps us to go so much deeper in our relationships with not only other people, but also the Lord, right? How many of you so much prefer your marriage after a long time as, a pair, as compared to the marriage when it was young and fresh? Why is that? Because you know your spouse better? Because there's so much more nuance and merit and weight to it? Right? It's, it's so amazing to celebrate a wedding or an anniversary of 20, 30, or 40, or even 50 years. Right? Like five-year anniversary, great. Statistically, you're, you're better off than most people who get married. But like those 30-plus year anniversary celebrations, those are amazing because... In relationships, over time, you, you develop those depths and those nuances. You learn so much about each other. Right? And those are incredibly important. Right? And doctrine, let me say this. Let me just define the word doctrine for us because I feel like it might be helpful. Right? A doctrine is a set rule. Right? It, is, it is a sure thing. That's what doctrine is. Right? And, and many people define it as, our dogma or our belief structure in its most basic simple form a doctrine is a rule or a sure thing right and so jesus is god right oh, folks jesus is god right hey thank you that's a doctrine right a doctrine is anything that we are convinced of that is sure that is a rule for us on our rules jesus is god and so if you're going to argue or say Jesus is not God, well, you're breaking, you're breaking the doctrine. Right? You're walking away from the sound doctrine. And doctrine is incredibly important, especially on these big picture things of who is God? Who is Jesus? What is the Trinity? How is man saved? And doctrine is important because on those big things, that means you either are saved and are going to heaven, you're part of our fellowship, or, or you're not. Right? There are Latter-day Saints. There are Jehovah's Witnesses. There are... Of Mormons, there are a variety of other groups within five miles of here that, while I'm sure are incredibly nice people, deny the basic core doctrines of the Bible. They deny that Jesus is God. They say Jesus is a great teacher, a healer, a savior, yes. But they deny his divinity. They say that he is not God himself. And if you say that Jesus is not God himself, then you have walked away from the gospel. You've devoided the gospel of its power. Doctrine matters because it is the means by which discipleship happens. Right? So Jesus tells the apostles in the, in, the, on the, in the Great Commission on that mountain, he says, go to the ends of the earth and replicate. He says, baptize them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Right? Make disciples. And remember that we said that he was telling them to replicate themselves, to emulate what he did with them with other people. Well, what did Jesus do for three years with the apostles? He taught them doctrine. He taught them how to live their lives according to doctrine. And doctrine's important. Doctrine matters because it is the means by which we make disciples. How can you disciple somebody if you don't know who Jesus is? You can't. You can't do it well, at least. You've got to know at least the basic doctrines of the gospel. 
Who is Jesus? What is the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to be faithful? What is, it, what is a disciple? What does it mean to disciple others? These are important, basic, fundamental doctrines that are necessary for missions because in missions and in the space that missions happens, relationships, we must have doctrines to build deep roots. We must have doctrine to build strong disciples. Tying this back into Father's Day a little bit, one of the greatest things that fathers do is train and prepare their kids for the hard stuff in life. I was terrified to have a daughter because I know how broken the world is. It's a messed up world. Like, I know you can't train a one-year-old to, to carry a firearm, but it crossed my mind. That's how broken I feel the world is, that I want her to be prepared, and I want her to be safe, and I want everything right to go for her. And fathers get that joy of training and preparing their kids. In the same way, we as the church have an obligation. We have a command and a calling. See, discipleship, we think of it as just this great way to build the church and get more people saved. And I don't know that that really is that great of a motivator for us, is it? And that's really a shame. But the fact is, is that discipleship is not just to how do we get more people in the pews and participating in what's going on here. Discipleship and missions is really about... How do we train and equip these children of God made in the image of God to deal with the crap that's going on in this world? That's discipleship. Let me say that again because I think someone was not paying attention. Discipleship is how we train the children of God who are made in the image of God to deal with all the crap that's going on in the world today. That's discipleship. And hopefully you hear that and think, oh, okay, this, this makes a lot more sense. It's not just about being book smart or Bible smart. It's about being prepared to deal with the crap that we're looking at in the world right now. And Lord help me, there's a lot of it. The world around us is crumbling, it's falling apart, it's, it's a catastrophe. Even just in the political sphere, Lord help us. There are people calling for anarchy and rebellion who claim to be Christians. There are people who do all sorts of manner of nonsense. There are people who lay down their crowns and their thrones at the feet of political leaders. Folks, these are very unbiblical ideas and very unbiblical things to do. And the problem is nobody understands that. There will be Facebook videos. There's been a hundred Facebook videos sent to me that float around the internet that say the end is nigh because Trump lost the election. Lord help us. Have some deep theology, folks. Have some doctrine that says that Trump and all the other presidents after him are nobody compared to the king on the real throne. Right? Right? And I don't care if it's R or D or I or whatever letter of the alphabet people want to call their political party. Those are our political leaders. God gives them to us for various reasons. How many of you know that God will give a corrupt people a bad government to punish them? That's harsh. I get it. That's harsh. And I don't, I don't necessarily know that that's what's happening here and now. I won't speak for God other than what he tells me plainly in his word, but the reality is people, people are, are so easily swayed by breezes of false doctrine. Not great gusts and, and, and hurricanes of false doctrine that would take even a strong man aside, but just faint breezes of false doctrine and lies that, that lead people astray. Church, doctrine matters. And, and we must have deep, sound, strong doctrine. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor me as prisoner, but share in the sufferings for the gospel by the power of God. How many of you believe we have inalienable rights that are acknowledged in the Constitution for us? Believe this for years. We have the right to self-defense. We have the right to keep and to bear arms. We have the right to free speech. We have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Locke, right? You know how many rights the Bible says you have? You have the right to die. And I know that sounds just incredibly harsh. I almost even hate to say it out loud from the pulpit. But we lowly sinners have the right to death. We don't have the right to free speech. We don't have the right to keep and to bear arms. We don't have the right to do as we see fit. 
I love America and I love this country we're in because it's great. It truly is amazing. And I love our concepts and our beliefs and life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness because I believe that creates a prosperous, free, God-fearing society. I truly believe that. I do. But Lord, help us. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can you imagine trying to reconcile the concept that you just want to be happy with being faithful and obedient and following Jesus? What does Jesus say? You want to follow me? Great. Deny yourself. Deny your happiness. Deny your rights and pursuits that you want to have. He doesn't say, let's just go and figure this out on the way. What does he say? Take up your cross and follow me. Does dying sound like life? Does dying sound like liberty to you? And I don't want to put down or belittle or take away anything from people who have made this country what it is. And I believe that there have been millions that have sacrificed of themselves for the good of this country. And I, and I truly am grateful for such things. But ultimately, the things that will make any country great, whether again or for the first time, is humble obedience to the Lord, knowing great sound doctrine. A country that is characterized by relationships that focus on Jesus. That is what is glorifying. That is what is good. The final reason is Jesus. Jesus is the reason discipleship happens. Relationships are the space in which it happens. Doctrine are the means by which discipleship happens. And Jesus is the reason discipleship happens. Why are you here? Why are you sitting in this pew listening to some little punk 28-year-old kid who has no Bible training at an official seminary level talk to you about the Bible? Why? Because Jesus matters. Because you at least want to care about Jesus. Jesus is the reason discipleship happens. And if you love Jesus and you want to follow Jesus, guess what? You have a command to be in discipleship. You have a command to disciple others. And if you think, I'm not qualified, I don't know sound doctrine, I can't go in those depths. Listen, do you, <laughs> you can read, can't you? Everybody here can read? Right? We all have copies of the Bible? Those are two things that all 12 apostles couldn't do. Like we forget that there is a time in which most people couldn't read. The apostles were a bunch of poor bloke working kids from the backwoods of Jerusalem that didn't know how to read. Right? They learned, some of them learned to write, they, and, and that's great, that's wonderful, but you already have more resources than much of the church and most Christians for the last 2,000 years. Right? The reason the King James Bible became so prevalent, so important, because it's the first time that the average Christian could do this could hold their own paper Bible and not have to listen to some guy in a robe in a pulpit tell them what it said. And if you love and you care about Jesus, how rich are you if you have one of these? Jesus is the reason we're here. Jesus is the reason discipleship happens because when you care about this and you want to know what doctrine is and what deep good doctrine looks like, then you want to do that in context of others. You want to learn from people. You want to look at their lives and see how they emulate Christ in themselves. You want to learn how they do a sin in their own life, how they love their families and how they live with their families. You want to learn how they pursue knowledge of the Word so that they can live it out. That's discipleship. Discipleship matters. Discipleship is the ultimate goal of missions. There, there is a current trend that comes out of Kentucky and it's made its way to Huntington and, and it's even creeped up into Gallup Police a little bit, but it's called City Church. And City Church's model is discipleship. They don't have big fancy buildings. In fact, they split their congregations regularly to go and, and start other congregations, but they do discipleship. And I sat there, some of you are with me, I think Lee was there, uh, in Huntington at a discipleship conference they held and one guy walked up front and then they brought up the two or three guys that they, he discipled brought up the handful that they discipled brought up the handful that they discipled the next thing you know there's 40 or 50 people standing up there 
that reaches from Lexington, Kentucky to Huntington. No planned anything. Just guys that want to share about Jesus. Discipleship is the how of missions. Discipleship is the means of missions. It takes place in relationships. It takes place in togetherness. It takes place in the back and forth. And it focuses on Jesus. Lord, we want to thank you for this time. Lord, I'm thankful that you have given us innumerable resources. That you have given us brains that think, that question, that that ask, that want to know. Lord, you say that no one can inherit the kingdom of heaven unless they come to you like a young child. And Lord, I think of children and how hungry they are to learn and to know. So Lord, I pray that that would characterize us, that we would have a desire to learn, to know, to grow. Lord, that we wouldn't want to, to be disciples who make disciples. It's in your name we hope and pray. Amen.
if you know somebody who's got a father who maybe doesn't have any family or anything, give them a call. Uh, enjoy this time together. Remember that we have one true great father, and that our fathers point us to him. Uh, Tell them to pray for us. Gracious, Dylan.